Hello everyone, good morning, and welcome to the Parkinson's Disease Patient and Family Symposium. Thank you for joining us today um, for our webinar. My name is Erin Checky, and I am the Senior Program Coordinator at Northwestern's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Center in Chicago, Illinois. And I will be moderating today's webinar. Today, in partnership with the Parkinson's Foundation, we are presenting our annual Parkinson's Disease Patient and Family Symposium. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. After we hear from today's speakers, we'll take questions from our web audience during the Q&A panel. Questions can be submitted throughout today's webinar by clicking on the Q&A icon in the black banner on the bottom of your viewing page. We will do our best to address as many questions as we can. All meeting attendees will be muted during the program to help reduce background noise and echo. If you are experiencing any te technical difficulties, please send us a message using the Q&A icon. And we will be recording today's virtual symposium. The recording, along with any resources discussed, including my contact information, will be sent to attendees in an email within the next week. I will now introduce Dr. Danny Vega, who will kick off today's event. Dr. Vega is an Associate Professor of Neurology and the Director of the Neurology Residency Program at Northwestern. He has expertise in the care and management of patients with a variety of movement disorders, including Parkinson's disease, and is the Director of the Northwestern's Huntington's Disease and Wilson's Disease Clinics. His primary area of interest is the study of alternative and non-pharmacologic interventions in movement disorders and their impact on quality of life and he has received several grants to carry out this research. Thank you, Dr. Vega. Thank you, Erin, and uh, thank you to everybody who's uh, joining us. Um, I am Danny Vega. I'm coming to you live from Northwestern. Um, and welcome again to our Parkinson's Disease Patient and Family Symposium, which is brought to you by Northwestern and the Parkinson Foundation. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be doing this. We're, we do this uh, once a year, large educational event. And um, this is our first time doing a virtual event. Um, and while we really miss the opportunity to meet with all of our patients, families, and friends uh, in person, uh, I'm very excited that we're able to, to get this the word out about Parkinson's and education about Parkinson's to the community uh, to reach people that sometimes can't come down uh, to our events. and. Um, hopefully you can all enjoy uh, a little education about Parkinson's from home, uh, wherever you're watching from with your family. And so I want to thank you for letting us into your homes um, as we uh, navigate this new virtual world. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, our program uh, at Northwestern and about what you can expect um, from the rest of today. Uh, and just bear with us uh, as we navigate this technology. So. At Northwestern, our mission is to provide comprehensive multidisciplinary care for patients and families with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders while we work on research into causes and treatments. And multidisciplinary care is very uh, relevant to Parkinson's disease uh, because it really takes many experts to, to navigate uh, the world of, of someone with Parkinson's. Um, we, we aim to promote health education and support for patients family members, partners, healthcare providers, and to the community. And, and of course, that's one of the reasons we're doing this event today to provide that education. So why, why I talk about multidisciplinary care is that Parkinson's disease is a very complicated condition and actually a, a very different condition from person to person. We say that if you've met a person with Parkinson's, you've met one person with Parkinson's um, because really some people struggle with more of the uh, visible motor symptoms of Parkinson's, things like tremors uh, and walking problems. Whereas we know that there's actually a whole host of symptoms that can be present variably from person to person that we consider sort of below the surface. Um, things like changes in sense of smell or confusion, trouble with sleep or fatigue, uh, trouble with dizziness, depression and anxiety. and and. While this isn't a, a, a menu of things that everybody with Parkinson's gets, we realize that there's a, a nuance to managing Parkinson's disease where we really need to address many different issues 
uh, differently from person to person. And it often takes different experts to deal with these different problems. So we deal with this in a comprehensive way with uh, both medical, neurological, and, and surgical management, as well as nursing care, uh, rehabilitation services, which you're gonna hear more about from our team at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, um, exercise and fitness classes, which we're always talking about as being important in Parkinson's, in, in uh, your ability to remain empowered and slow down your disease, um, social services and support, and, and clinical trials into new uh, drugs and treatments uh, to improve life and slow down disease. Our, our program is, is ever growing and uh, a few things that we've actually developed in the last few years include a palliative clinic specifically for movement disorders, patients with more advanced disease, uh, a movement disorders cognitive clinic led by Dr. Jennifer Goldman, who will be on our panel later today, a neurogenetics clinic, which is led by the chairman of our neurology department, Dr. Dimitri Krantz, uh, which really brings together uh, basic science research and the clinic. Um, and uh, it really gets into the nuances of how we might in the future manage Parkinson's disease as an individual disorder. Um, and many new faces actually in terms of neurologists and social workers and nurses helping to manage uh, Parkinson's disease. We're also streamlining more and more with our partners at Lake Forest and Central DuPage. This just represents the neurologists with expertise in Parkinson's disease just on our downtown campus. And it shows you how huge a team we're, we're, we've been growing over the last few years. In particular, uh, uh, three new neurologists who have just started this year with us, Dr. Danielle Larson, Dr. Rizwan Akhtar, and Dr. Alan Wu. We also, not shown in the picture, have three clinical fellows who you may meet when you come down and see us, um, who are you know, the future neurologists uh, who are gonna be experts in Parkinson's disease. Uh, we have four clinical nurses, three social workers, a huge rehab team at our Shirley Ryan Ability Lab affiliate, a neuropsychologist, neuropsychiatrist, genetic counselor, and neurosurgeon who's part of our team. And in this new era, telemedicine has been a big part of our lives. Uh, while we're still you know, working on figuring out how to best combine uh, the need to really have that uh, personal touch with our patients, but also be able to bring safe and thoughtful care to people who uh, have trouble coming down to see us are, or have you know, health issues that, that pro prohibit them from being able to come down and see us and finding ways to balance uh, the in-person visits and the, the virtual visits. Um, and this is something that we've gotten better and better about over the last several months out of necessity, but I think it's something that's here to stay long-term and which we actually are excited about optimizing. And so this, our keynote speaker today is actually gonna be talking about technology and Parkinson's disease um, as, as this is something that we're bringing more and more into our, into our practice. Our support groups, which we offer many of, uh, from general Parkinson's support to care partner support, young Parkinson's support groups, women's support groups, uh, Parkinson's disease 101, which is a general informational session about Parkinson's, and other physical activity uh, exercise programs that we're doing across our campuses are also transitioning to virtual platforms and again, we're working on finding combinations of in-person and virtual ways to bring this to you conveniently. So please take advantage of as many of those as possible. And you'll hear more about those from uh, Aaron later on today. Northwestern is also a leader in what we call translational research. And what that means is we have scientists here who are really experts in focusing their careers on Parkinson's disease research in the laboratory. And we have experts focused on Parkinson's disease management in the clinic. And, and we have people really working in teams on developing a bridge between the work that's being done in the laboratory and the work that's being done at the bedside with you day to day. Uh, and this is uh, uh, something that uh, Northwestern uh, scientists are highly funded in, in doing this sort of, sort of bench to bedside research. Um, and, and what we see as the future is personalized neurology, personalized management of Parkinson's because this is such an individual disease we're starting to learn about the importance of the combination of involving genetics, the environment, and what we call epigenetics, which is things that modify individual genetic uh, uh, abnormalities, and how each person's 
combination of these factors may, may lead to a risk for Parkinson's and that particular disease may be different for those reasons. And we may need to target these things differently in different people. Even if we look at the level of one particular cell in the brain, there may be differences in different problems in the cell that can affect someone's Parkinson's compared to another. Perhaps in one person, more inflammation in a cell or problems with the mitochondria, which is the energy producer of the cell, or the way proteins build up in the brain in one person compared to another. And all of these pieces of the puzzle are, are targets of potential therapies that are being investigated and will eventually lead us to, I think, personalized, individualized treatments for people with Parkinson's disease. In the meantime, what do we do today? We, we have new technology, new treatments, new drugs all the time. Every year, we're, there are new drugs that are being uh, uh, developed and approved for Parkinson's disease. And this, this year alone, there have been four or five new medications to manage symptoms and to, to improve day-to-day -day life for people with Parkinson's disease, including new methods of delivering medications uh, like some shown here. And we continue to harp on the importance of exercise, physical activity, cognitive activity, and being mentally and physically active day to day. Because it will always be true that the things that you can do for yourself, the things that, that improve your quality of life, are the things that empower you day to day to make life better. So whether that's exercise, whether that's uh, doing art or music, whether it's, it's finding things that day to day get you excited to get up, that, that give you purpose each day and that improve your physical functioning and your cognitive functioning. So don't underestimate the importance of those things. So themes today as we transition into our talks um, is to be optimistic about the horizon and you're gonna hear about some uh, updates on research from our, our clinic director, uh, Tanya Samuni. Um, we're going to uh, hear about, um, you're going to hear about what we offer in our center um, and about clinical trials, which hopefully you'll inquire about. Um, and then how to utilize our resources, the education and the support that we offer. And then our multidisciplinary team and how to maximize the, uh, the support that we can offer in different, by different specialists in our team. Realize that we have really potent medications to treat Parkinson's disease symptoms today and new ones coming out all the time. And remember to really be active because it makes a big difference in your day-to-day -day life. I wanna thank the sponsors who uh, are really involved in Parkinson's disease day-to-day -day and who we couldn't uh, uh, conduct these educational events without. And our sponsors for today's event are Abbott, uh, the Parkinson Foundation, Boston Scientific, Medtronic, Adamus, Synovian, Supernus, Kiowakirin, Lundbeck, and Amniel. I also, uh, as, we, as we look into the uh, agenda and, and, and starting the, the program for today, I also wanna thank a few people behind the scenes. And um, uh, first of all, Erin, uh, our social worker, who uh, is also our program coordinator, uh, who started with us this year and has done an amazing job and has organized this event today. Uh, so thank you to Erin, uh, to, to the Parkinson Foundation, Jessica Barsh and, and Danielle uh, Agpalo, who are, are uh, helping with today's event, um, and to all of our panelists, uh, speakers, um, who you're gonna meet today, uh, and all of our sponsors, of course. Um, and so with that, this, this being the agenda for the day, I'm gonna hand the reins back over to Aaron, uh, who is going to uh, take us into our first talk. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for being with us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Vega. Um, as a quick reminder, questions can be submitted throughout today's webinar by clicking on the Q&A icon in the black banner on the bottom of your viewing page. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ray Dorsey. Dr. Dorsey is the David M. Levy Professor of Neurology and the Director of the Center for Health and Technology at the University of Rochester in New York. Dr. Dorsey is helping investigate new treatments for movement disorders and improve the way care is delivered for individuals with Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders. Using simple web-based video conferencing, he and his colleagues are seeking to provide care to individuals with Parkinson's and neurological diseases anywhere that they live.
Hello, my name is Ray Dorsey. I'm a neurologist at the University of Rochester and delighted and honored to be part of this symposium at Northwestern. Uh, all of you should uh, count yourselves lucky. Not many people have a Dr. Tanya Samuni as their uh, fearless advocate and leader. As many of you know, uh, Dr. Tanya Samuni is an outstanding clinician and Parkinson's specialist, but what many of you may not know is that Dr. Samuni is a nationally and internationally recognized uh, expert in evaluating new and promising treatments uh, for Parkinson's disease. And on a personal level, uh, not only is she tireless, but she's fearless. And in order to end Parkinson's disease, we're gonna need fearless leaders like uh, Tanya Samuni. So uh, today I wanted to discuss uh, with you over the next 15 to 20 minutes, how we can end Parkinson's disease. And this presentation is uh, based on a book that my colleagues and I really recently wrote on uh, ending Parkinson's disease and at the end I'll tell you how you can get a copy. If the cost of the book is an issue you can just email us at info at endingpd.org info at endingpd.org and we'll send you one for free just let us know your address. So we have a bold uh, premise here is that we can prevent and end uh, Parkinson's uh, disease. Um, so we didn't always uh, have uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, Parkinson's really grew up with the Industrial uh, Revolution, and before then we only had extremely rare uh, cases of it. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the age of degenerative and man-made diseases in which we currently live, talk about how uh, about the rise of Parkinson's disease and how it's been fueled by industrial products and byproducts, and how we can end Parkinson's disease through prevention, advocacy, care, and treatments, and maybe have a couple words about how technology can help. So uh, in 1959, the French-American scientist René Dubose wrote that every civilization has its own kind of pestilence and can control it only by reforming itself. In essence, every society creates its own diseases. And I'm going to argue to you that Parkinson's disease, like lung cancer, like type 2 diabetes, like obesity, is to a large extent uh, man-made. Uh, in 1971, an outstanding epidemiologist, Dr. Abdul Omran, uh, highlighted epi epidemiological transitions in the history of humans. And he said over the, he looked at what were the leading causes of death for humans over their 200,000 year existence. Initially, early humans died of pestilence and famine. Quite simply, there was not enough food. And then the agricultural revolution about 10,000 years ago addressed uh, the food shortage from um, many people but led to receding pandemics uh, as populations grew and were closer together, infectious diseases like the bubonic plague in the 14th century and the influenza pandemic in the 1918 uh, killed lots of people, millions. Uh, he said, we now live in the age of degenerative and man-made diseases, degenerative and man-made diseases. Easy examples of this are car accidents well, uh, uh, and certain cancers, and I'm gonna argue that uh, Parkinson's disease is to a large extent man-made. In the future, he said we were gonna uh, die of delayed degenerative diseases and emerging in infections, infections born out of hubris, and depending on what really is underlying cause of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, that actually might be an example. Um, so the classic, the poster child for man-made diseases is lung cancer, and if you look carefully, at this graph, and you look at lung cancer deaths around 1925 in the United States, there were almost none. Quite simply, lung cancer used not to exist. Uh, before the advent of cigarettes, doctors took special notice when confronted with a case of lung cancer, thinking it a once-in-a-lifetime oddity. However, cigarettes were introduced in the late 1800s, first in, in the United Kingdom and then in the United States, and 25 years later, you can see a corresponding rise in the number of lung cancer deaths. And one of the great public health accomplishments of the last 50 years has been a reduction in smoking. And along with that reduction in smoking cigarettes, we've seen a reduction in lung cancer deaths. And I'm going to use that as an analogy throughout uh, this discussion when we think about uh, Parkinson's disease and ties to uh, industrial products and byproducts. So Parkinson's disease is uh, in all likelihood a, rel a relatively new disease. Prior to Dr. Parkinson's uh, description of the disease in 1817, there are extremely rare reports of uh, Parkinson's disease, unlike epilepsy or migraine or stroke, uh, which you can find in uh, ancient texts. 
So what's going on in 1817 when Dr. Uh, James Parkinson is uh, writing uh, his essay on six peoples that he identified with Parkinson disease? Well, 1817 is the height of the Industrial Revolution and London's the capital. Uh, and the London fog in the early 1800s had little to do with weather and everything to do with air pollution. The picture you can see here is not too dissimilar from a modern day picture of Beijing where the rates of Parkinson's disease are growing most rapidly. Um, and indeed, you can see people covering their mouths not for fear of getting tuberculosis or COVID or influenza, they're covering their mouths to uh, protect themselves from the toxic effects of air pollution. Uh, and several studies since uh, that time have linked uh, air pollution uh, to Parkinson's disease. And it's quite possible that air pollution, small particulate ma matter, may be carrying heavy metals in through the nose back to the brain and contributing uh, to Parkinson's uh, disease. Uh, as I said, uh, Parkinson's, or maybe I haven't said, Parkinson's disease is the world's fastest growing brain disease. The world's fastest gr growing brain disease is not Alzheimer's disease, it's Parkinson's disease. Over the last 25 years, the number of people with Parkinson's disease has more than doubled globally. And if we don't act, if this generation, if you listeners and Dr. Samuni and I don't act, the number of people with Parkinson's disease will double again in the coming 20, uh, next 25 years. Today, about 200 Americans will be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and another 100 will die of the disease. And as you know, if you've heard Dr. Samuni uh, speak, Parkinson's disease doesn't necessarily begin in the brain, although some cases do. Uh, and initial features of the disease aren't tremor and slowness of movement, but are loss of smell, anosmia, or constipation. And these two early features of Parkinson's disease might give us a clue to where the disease is beginning. And uh, as I alluded to, air pollution and certain heavy metals have been linked to Parkinson's disease, and those likely enter into the nose. Certain pesticides, many of which are just nerve toxins, are either inhaled uh, from people who work with them or ingested from those who uh, drink contaminated water or food laden with uh, pesticides. And other industrial chemicals like trichloroethylene um, are also either inhaled or ingested. So the earliest features of the disease, anosmia, loss of smell, and constipation may also be linked to the earliest signs of pathology of the disease and may give us a clue as to where the disease begins. As I indicated, air pollution has been linked uh, to Parkinson's disease. And if you look at the rise of air pollution, it uh, mirrors the rise of Parkinson's disease. Air pollution, as I indicated, began in Western Europe, uh, then came to the North America and the United States, and then to Asia, and is still relatively low in Africa. And if you look at the map of, where, uh, of rates of Parkinson's disease, you'll find it to be highest in Europe, Western Europe, and the United States. You'll find it lowest to be in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and you'll find it to be rising most rapidly in uh, Asia, including countries like China, where the rates of Parkinson's disease adjusted for age have more than doubled. Other uh, factors have been linked uh, to Parkinson's disease, and those in include uh, synthetic or industrial uh, pesticides, and even some naturally occurring pesticides like rotenone. And these pesticides were really introduced in the 1950s. They have uh, rapidly spread throughout the industrialized world, Many of these pesticides are uh, fat soluble and means they can access the brain and are designed to kill nerves. One of them is called Paraquat. Paraquat is considered the most toxic herbicide ever killed. It kills the weeds that round up camps. Um, uh, it's used to commit homicide uh, and suicide and it's so toxic that 32 countries, 32 countries including China have banned Paraquat, but used in the United States has doubled over the last decade and tripled over the last generation. You can see that Paraquat is uh, widely used throughout uh, large parts of the United States, and including and covering uh, farms in Illinois. Uh, Paraquat increases the risk of Parkinson's disease anywhere from 50 to 150%, and Paraquat, when fed to mice, reproduces the behavioral and the uh, pathological features of Parkinson's disease. Indeed, many of the animal model, early animal models of uh, Parkinson's disease were based on pesticides, including Paraquat. Pesticides are not the only uh, uh, environmental factor associated with uh, Parkinson's disease. This industrial solvent called trichloroethylene, uh, or TCE, was uh, considered to be ubiquitous in the 1970s, was used to decaffeinate coffee, was used as an anesthetic, 
was used in dry cleaning, used as a, widely used as a degreaser. Uh, 8% of workers in the United Kingdom are estimated to have worked with this chemical. And we discussed this chemical uh, in the book, uh, uh, Ending Parkinson's Disease, which I'll show right here. And I'm just gonna read you a little bit of a story about uh, Danny Fromm, uh, who was kind enough to share his story uh, in the book. And I'll sh share uh, his story with you now. In 1988, Danny Fromm was a typical Southern California teenager who enjoyed working on cars, especially his red 1972 Chevy Nova with a black top. He paid $1,300 for it, money he had saved from working as a gas station attendant at the local Unical 76. Fromm and his buddies replaced the car's engine, which made it really awesome and really fast, he recalled. The car gave the 17-year-old the freedom that he craved, freedom to do what he wanted, when he wanted, freedom that he no longer has. Straight out of high school, Fromm began working in the aerospace industry, cleaning circuit boards with the solvent trichloroethylene, TCE. Never warned of any risk or provided with protective gear, he inhaled the sweet smelling chemical and ex exposed his skin to it for eight hours a day over the course of a decade. When Fromm was 35, he noticed that his right pinky kept twitching. Stressed, his first doctor said, and recommended a little wine. His second doctor gave him a much different diagnosis, Parkinson's disease. Uh, I'm gonna skip a forward a little bit. Fromm is now 48 and lives in Idaho with his wife and six-year-old son, Logan. He has two older sons who live nearby with their mother. In the morning, Fromm has trouble walking. He has what he calls a hardcore shuffle. So he takes his immediate medication immediately after he wakes up and he does leg exercises to relieve his leg stiffness. He is then able to get out of bed, shower, and dress without assistance. He and his son Logan spend a lot of time together. Occasionally, Logan will mimic Fromm's walk, even his shuffle, in a good-natured way. His son rarely speaks of the disease, though, Fromm says. I better have a good relationship with Logan. He's going to take care of me when I'm older. Fromm regrets every day that he stayed at his aerospace job working with trichloroethylene, sometimes called tri or trike. While the solvent has not been proven definitively to cause Parkinson's, those who are exposed to it at work are six times more likely to develop the disease than those who are not. If you're working with it, Fromm says, quit your damn job and get away from it. And so you need not have just worked with trichloroethylene uh, to be affected by it. Uh, over half of Superfund sites, federally designated uh, sites for cleanup that are so, uh, federally designated sites for cleanup, uh, over half of these sites, including many in Illinois and, and many in Chicago or near Chicago, are contaminated with TCE. Over half of Superfund sites in the United States designated for cleanup are contaminated with a chemical that increases the risk of Parkinson's disease by 500%. Um, this TCE is uh, inappropriately just often poured into the ground. It then leaks into the ground and then contaminates groundwater. It's considered the most con common uh, contaminant of groundwater in the United States. It then enters these underground plumes, which can migrate miles and evaporate from the ground in the soil, much like radon, and enter people's homes, workplaces, and schools undetected. I found out in the course of writing uh, the book that there was a, uh, a TCE plume uh, 15 minutes from my house. And we discussed the story of an individual who lived in this neighborhood. And one day I noticed that uh, they could no longer run up a hill and were subsequently diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Uh, these uh, contaminated sites are found throughout the United States. 21 are found in Silicon Valley where TCE was widely used in, uh, to clean silicon wafers. They're found in Michigan. They're found in Las Vegas. And in uh, preparation for this uh, uh, call with you, I found reports in DuPage County where TCE had contaminated uh, water uh, for people uh, getting their water from private wells in DuPage County. TCE has real consequences. Uh, Jane Horton lives uh, in Mountain View, California, across the street from Google, uh, the headquarters of Google. The headquarters of Google is located on a uh, Superfund site that was contaminated uh, with TCE by uh, Intel and Fairchild Semiconductor. She found out about this, had her indoor air tested because she lived uh, right near the site and found it to have high levels of TCE in her, in her house. She had, in her words, her house cut, butchered, and vented, 
and had this out outdoor uh, ven this ventilation system put in that sucks out air from underneath her house and emits it above her house. The good thing about TC contamination is that you can abate it, you can treat it, and you can uh, prevent it by even putting a vapor barrier over uh, in areas for new construction or install remediation sy systems for those that are already contaminated. Uh, so I told you a little bit about the rise of Parkinson's disease, so what can we do to uh, address it? So we can uh, start with a PACT, P-A-C-T, to end Parkinson's disease. Prevent, advocate, care, and treat. So the first thing we need to do is with any pandemic, whether it's COVID or uh, wildfires or Parkinson's disease, is to prevent, is to contain it and prevent other people from becoming affected. So we need to do that by banning, banning paraquat and trichloroethylene. These chemicals have, the EPA has proposed banning both of them, but they have, uh, the present administration has yet to act on, on doing so. Uh, in our book, we have some black pages at the back, which outline a prescription for action to end Parkinson's disease. And the first one is to contact the EPA administrator, Andrew Wheeler, and ask him to ban the pesticide paraquat and the chemical uh, TCE. We give you his email address and his phone number, 202-564-4700. I sent him a copy of this book and along with a nice note, and I called his office asking him to ban paraquat. I encourage you to do the same. And you can also exercise. Vigorous exercise not only helps people with the disease, but can prevent lower the risk of developing the disease by about 20%. The Mediterranean diet, high in fruits and vegetables, low in uh, animal products uh, may also be beneficial for those with the disease and in preventing the disease. And modest amounts of, of caffeine, the equivalent to one to four cups of caffeinated coffee can help as well, as can wearing a helmet and protecting against head trauma. We need to make our voices heard. In the 1980s, we, confront, we confronted, a, society confronted an unknown virus that was rapidly fatal and we had no federal response. In that setting, a group of HIV activists in New York City, led by the late Larry Kramer, adopted a motto of silence equals death. For Parkinson's disease, silence doesn't equal death, but it equals suffering and needless suffering. The 1.1 million Americans who have Parkinson's disease need to make their voices heard. We need to push for more research funding for Parkinson's disease. At the same time, the number of Americans is, with the disease has increased 35%. Funding for Parkinson's disease from the NIH adjusted for inflation has actually decreased. 35% increase in the number of people with the disease. Funding uh, adjusted for inflation has decreased. Uh, participate uh, in research like many of you are doing with Dr. Samuni. We need to improve the way we develop, uh, way we deliver care. My colleagues and I have been uh, advocating for telemedicine for over a decade. In the setting of a pandemic, we've uh, seen broad, uh, broad adoption of telemedicine. However, all of the uh, policy changes that have enabled uh, many Medicare beneficiaries, including many of you, to receive care via telemedicine are temporary. They are temporary in the setting of a public health emergency. We need to make sure that these uh, policy changes become permanent. And then we need better treatments, and Dr. Samuni is leading this effort. But to get better treatments, we need better measures of the disease. <clears throat> you know, we currently measure the disease by having you tap your thumb and index finger and having someone like Dr. Samuni rate that as a two, and someone like me might rate it as a one. We need objective measures of the disease. All of us carry around with us uh, supercomputers called smartphones. We can use these devices and others to get objective, real-world measures of the disease. Uh, any uh, for participants regardless of uh, where they live. Um, finally, I got to acknowledge my uh, co-authors. Dr. Todd Scher is, uh, uh, is the CEO of the Michael J. Fox Foundation and 20 years ago uh, conducted groundbreaking research identifying that chronic exposure of a pesticide called rotenone can replicate the effects of Parkinson's disease in mice. Dr. Michael Oaken is the medical director for the Parkinson's Foundation and uh, is a pioneer in deep brain stimulation. And Dr. Boss Bloom is a Parkinson specialist in the Netherlands who's created the largest integrated care uh, program for Parkinson disease called Parkinson Net. Um, uh, I also want to thank uh, many of the people who share their stories. I think over 40 people share their stories and they are featured in the book. As you can tell from the book, it's not highly technical. Uh, it's made to be read by people like you and it shares the stories of people who are not too dissimilar from you, farmers, veterans, and people like Danny Fromm who are suffering with the disease. 
Finally, we need to make our voices heard. You can uh, order uh, the book uh, right now uh, while you're at home uh, on uh, Amazon. So hopefully I got this right. Uh, you can just go to Ending Parkinson's, you can order it. Uh, all the author's proceeds are being used to, uh, uh, they're being devoted to efforts to end Parkinson's. All the authors are donating their efforts, their proceeds to efforts to end Parkinson's. If you've read the book, please click on ratings and review the book. We need to get the word out. Uh, Parkinson's, we are in the midst of a, of a COVID pandemic and we're in the midst of a Parkinson pandemic. The only way these pandemics are ended is when broad uh, members of society rise up, take action, and gather together to work to prevent people from ever developing the disease and work to end it. Thank you very much. All right, and thank you to everyone who has been submitting questions along the way. Please continue to do so using the Q&A icon. We will be sharing all resources discussed, including a link to purchase Dr. Dorsey's book along with um, the recording in an email within the next week. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tanya Simuni. Dr. Simuni heads Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Center, which is recognized by the Parkinson's Foundation as a center of excellence. She is a world-renowned expert in Parkinson's disease modification studies, has more than 100 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals and book chapters, and has lectured nationally and internationally on Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. Good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Parkinson's uh, Disease uh, Movement Disorders uh, Symposium at Northwestern uh, 2020. First of all, I want to join Dr. Uh, Baker in welcoming you uh, to this virtual program. As all of us are aware, there are a lot of new things and different things happening in 2020 and virtual format of the program is one of them. And I think that as many of you look at the challenges of this year and reflect on them, and I always try to find a silver underpinning and the fact that we can reach much larger audience and that you didn't have to travel two hours to get to this uh, program is one of them. So without further ado, I will start my presentation but before that, I want to express huge thank you to everyone who made this program uh, possible. First and foremost, uh, our uh, center uh, outreach coordinator, Erin Churchy, who worked tirelessly with uh, Jesse uh, Erickson, our program uh, administrator, uh, Dr. Baker, our team at the Parkinson Foundation, who really made uh, a lot of effort to make this exciting and amenable to uh, the virtual quote unquote reality. So without further ado, uh, the topic of my presentation is Parkinson's disease, new therapeutics 2020. Uh, these are my disclosures and some of them are relevant to the programs that I will be discussing over the next uh, 20 minutes. Uh, this, these are the objectives of my talk. I will start with a brief overview of the newly approved drugs uh, over the last uh, year, and there have been a number of them. I will focus my presentation on experimental therapeutics specifically aimed at testing potential slowing progression of the disease. And I will finish with a discussion of genetically targeted therapeutics and the concept of genetic testing as it applies to Parkinson's disease. This diagram provides a high-level overview of uh, how we understand the natural history of progression of the disease. And for everyone who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, the journey starts here. When you came to the physician and physician said that you have signs of early Parkinson's disease. And we have a lot of effective therapeutics to treat the motor manifestations of early disease. With the progression of the disease, as some of you are well aware, there are certain signs of less of the responsiveness to medications, uneven response of, uh, to medications, drug-induced involuntary movements that are called dyskinesia. And again, uh, the drug development for those indications has been quite active, and we'll talk about some of those uh, therapeutics. 
And then people in the more advanced stages of the uh, disease, when they start experiencing what we call non-motor manifestations of the disease, including psychiatric, cognitive uh, domains, balance impairment. And that's where we definitely need to make much more effort into the development of better therapeutic uh, strategies. There is the whole left side of the slide uh, that is labeled as prodromal stage of the uh, disease. And we'll talk more about it at the end of the presentation. So as I have uh, said, I will start with a brief overview of the new drugs that have been approved over the last 12 months. And the good news are that the market has been quite active and the drug development has been uh, quite active. Uh, there are two subclasses in that category that I will review. The first one, what we label as rescue therapies for uh, management of unexpected medication wearing off. Again, applies to people with more advanced disease who take their regular Parkinson's medications. And despite uh, that, the medications might not last as long and they experience periods of time when the medications do not work or have not kicked on yet. So two drugs have been approved for that indication. One of them is inhaled levodopa, and the, upper, uh, and the other one is upper morphine sublingual strip that was approved very recently. And the next class are standing medications that compared to the rescue therapies that you take when you need them are taken in conjunction with the rest of your medication regimen. Two drugs have been approved and we'll talk more about those as well. So in the category of rescue therapies, I purposefully have put two drugs side by side for the comparison. The first of them is inhaled levodopa that has been on the market for a number of months uh, by now. So some of you probably are taking it and more familiar with it. Uh, the brand name is Embridger. It's inhaled levodopa. So your old familiar uh, drug packaged as a powder in uh, the inhaler preparation and uh, the person can open that inhaler and inhale uh, the medication. Efficacy was tested in uh, phase three uh, studies and efficacy was measured by time to onset of the effect. And based on the studies and these data come uh, from the package insert, the onset of action was within 10 minutes, significant improvement by 30 minutes and duration of the effect exceeded uh, 60 minutes. Again, remember it's rescue therapy that is taken in addition to your regular medications. From the standpoint of the safety profile, very consistent with the mode of the drug delivery, about 15% of the participants experienced cough, upper respiratory infection uh, was less uh, common. And again, we're hearing similar uh, feedback from the patients while they're taking it already as an approved medication. On the right-hand side is more recently approved drug. Again, not a new drug. Apomorphine has been available for a number and number of years. It's actually one of the oldest Parkinson's medications. The challenge with it is that it has very short half-life, so you cannot give it as a pill. Currently in United States, uh, up until recently, it has been available as an injectable preparation, Apican uh, injections, and in Europe it is available as continuous infusion, which is also being tested in United uh, States. So this rescue preparation is sublingual strip, uh, akin to Listerine strip, uh, obviously very different structure and uh, chemical structure, but just so that you understand what uh, that is. The person puts it under the tongue, it dissolves under uh, the tongue, and the drug has been tested again. They, these are the data from the efficacy phase three uh, studies. The readout was slightly different. The primary outcome was the degree of the reduction of motor disability as measured by our standard uh, scales, and that was significant. And the secondary outcomes were time to onset of the effect. And again, the first time for the readout was 15 uh, minutes, and there was separation with placebo. Maximum effect was at 60 minutes, and duration of the effect persisted for more than 90 minutes. From the standpoint of safety, again, very consistent with the preparation of the uh, drug. It's uh, the strip that is put on the oral mucosa. So while the most common side effect was uh, nausea, again, consistent with the class effect of this drug, it belongs to dopamine agonists. The next mo most common was uh, oral uh, tissue irritation, mucosal irritation, and also consistent with the dopaminergic dopamine agonist side effect, somnolence 
balance was uh, fairly uh, calm. So again, two different drugs, uh, to different deliveries. Uh, both of them are now commercially available. And the important addition to the armamentarium of medications for people who experience those uh, episodes of off. So more data to come as we're developing experience once the drugs are uh, approved. Uh, the other uh, class of uh, drugs, adjunctive uh, therapies, again, are uh, approved for people with uh, more advanced stages of the disease who experience uneven response to medications compared to the rescue uh, therapies. These are, being, uh, are taken on a daily basis uh, for people for whom it's indicated. The first one is a pickup on Agentis that was approved very recently. It belongs to the class of CMT inhibitors. Again, that's not a new class of the drugs for Parkinson's. Another drug that is approved is Entacapone or Comtan. Uh, the differential of this uh, new drug is that it is once a day preparation that is being taken before bedtime. What about the efficacy? So the studies compared to placebo about one hour reduction of off time, which was significant. But to put it in the perspective, the average duration of off time, meaning the duration of hours during the day that the medications were not working in the tested uh, group of the participants was six hours. So that translates about 15% uh, reduction. Significant, but definitely wish that was better. From the standpoint of the uh, safety profile, all expected side effects, dyskinesia was at the top because you're increasing the level of dopaminergic uh, tone in the system. Constipation, uh, hypertension, uh, 5%. So that is agentis. On the right-hand side, another uh, new drug, uh, which is estradiazolin. Uh, the brand name is Noreans. Uh, this one actually is the first in the class of A to A antagonists. And without getting into much details of the chemical structure of uh, the drug, uh, this class of drugs has been shown to improve the duration of the effect of uh, dopaminergic replacement therapy. So again, another once a day preparation taken in conjunction with other Parkinson's medications, very similar to Angentis, approximately an hour of additional benefit compared to uh, placebo and very similar to Angentis, the participants had on average six hours off. Safety profile, very similar. So in summary, it's exciting to see the new drugs, but obviously, as you can see from the data, we wish that we had the drugs that would cover not additional one hour, but really would eliminate or significantly reduce that those six hours when medications are not working and other drugs are in the development. So now I will switch to the next uh, part of my presentation, which is experimental therapies in development. And I will start as I usually do with providing you the resources where you can look up the information, the most up-to-date information. So obviously clinicaltrials.gov is the most uh, comprehensive compendium. Every drug study is uh, required uh, to post uh, their information. Michael J. Fox has a very user-friendly website, Fox Trial Finder, which not only provides the information about the studies, but also can match the participants uh, based on their baseline disease characteristics and they, where they live uh, to the studies that they might qualify. We on our website list all of our uh, studies and I would strongly encourage you to look them up. And actually our senior project manager, Dr. Cynthia Punk has put together an excellent compendium of the slides uh, that will be uh, presented in between the talks uh, that provide brief overview of the studies that we are participating in actively recruiting. So please take advantage of that. On the right-hand side of the slide is the summary data of how active the field is. And the reason why I have put that information is it's really the message of hope. The more studies we have, the more chances we have that there will be winners in that process and that we will have better therapeutics delivered for patients. <laughs> This is an excellent review that was just published online uh, on uh, the pipeline of uh, clinical drug development in Parkinson's disease. And another reason why I'm highlighting it is that three senior authors on the paper are actually people with Parkinson's disease who had incredible 
incredible sophistication and commitment for, to put this very comprehensive compendium. So I would strongly encourage you to look it up. It's available online and um, you can access that. And for that reason, I actually used a number of visuals uh, from that publications as a distation of their commitment and actually acknowledgement of appreciation. And my next slide, again, this is the pie diagram of all the studies that are going on now at the top, disease modifying interventions, at the bottom, symptomatic therapies. And again, the major one is the message of hope based on how active the field is. I promise I'm not going to quiz you on every drug here and also obviously cannot cover each of them. So I will uh, cover the, some of the highlighted uh, programs. Let's start with phase three uh, studies. And phase three studies, just as a reminder to you, are the most advanced uh, drug development phase. These are the studies that are presented to FDA for approval of the drugs. And not unexpectedly, in that category, more of the half of the drugs are being tested for symptomatic management. And if you look in more detail on the uh, right in the yellow portion of the uh, pie chart, actually a number of these drugs are optimization of the delivery of levodopa. We still recognize that that is the best drug that we have. And if it could work longer and more smoothly, and if we could avoid those ups and downs of the response, we really have an excellent uh, therapy. I don't have time to cover these, but we are participating in some of those studies. And again, would reference you to our website and to the rolling slide deck uh, that will be presented during the course of the uh, symposium. This is the pie chart that summarizes the phase two studies. Those are earlier phases of the drug development, and that's where actually more than half of the pie is dedicated to disease-modifying interventions. Again, very reassuring, very uh, exciting uh, of how many drugs, how many different mechanisms uh, they're targeting. Let's talk about some selected ones. And in order to put it in perspective, let me remind you about the basics of the pathology of the disease. I show the slide pretty frequently. Uh, on the left uh, hand side is uh, the slice of the brain of a person who passed with history of Parkinson's disease, demonstrating that uh, the primary pathology uh, responsible for the motor signs of the disease resides in the part of the brain called uh, midbrain and specifically substantia nigra. And approximately 100 years ago, prominent pathologist Dr. Luik has demonstrated that actually cells uh, contain what is now called Lewy bodies. And for many years, it was not clear what is the major constituent of the cells. And approximately 20 years ago, there was seminal discovery that the major constituent of those Lewy bodies, which are the sine qua non of the Parkinson's related pathology, is accumulation of protein called alpha synuclein. And we'll talk more about it because it's a very important therapeutic target, synuclein targeting therapeutics. So is Sorry, I had a minor technical glitch, but I hope that that has been corrected. So let's uh, continue uh, with our uh, discussion. So um, alpha-synuclein is actually a normal constituent protein of uh, the cells that has a lot of important functions. But what happens with in Parkinson's disease, uh, it accumulates, it condenses and creates quote unquote clumps, what is called oligomeric uh, synuclein, as well as fibrils. And that abnormal accumulation, as well as failure of the cells to clear that protein, which creates toxic protein and contributes to the mechanism of the development of the disease. The bottom part of this slide summarizes that there are a number of potential therapeutic targets targeting synuclein. Uh, the one that is most advanced in the development is targeting synuclein that already has left the cells and propagating between uh, the cells. And we'll talk about synuclein uh, targeting uh, antibodies. 
So, so nuclein targeting uh, antibody uh, therapeutics are definitely at the forefront of uh, uh, drug uh, development. Two companies uh, have started their programs approximately at the same time. Both of these are phase two uh, drug development. The first one is uh, Roche, and because it started a little bit earlier, they actually just uh, two weeks ago presented uh, the results of their uh, study at the International Movement Disorders Congress. Well, the study did not uh, reach its primary uh, endpoint. Uh, the drug demonstrated signal of the efficacy for the reduction of motor disability and also uh, had a positive readout on uh, digital measures which are very important as more accurate assessment uh, and more long-term assessment of disability. So based on those results, the company has announced that they are planning to proceed with a phase three study, so more data are coming. Biogen started the program a little bit later, very similar concept, intravenous infusion of uh, cynuclein targeting antibodies. Uh, the data uh, collection for the first year of the study participation has been completed, and hopefully we'll be seeing the results uh, soon. Uh, we as a center have participated in both of the uh, studies that continue to participate, so huge thank you to the participants, and obviously we'll be sharing results as soon as the companies share the results uh, with us. This is a busy slide that summarizes other synuclein uh, targeting therapeutics. And again, I'm not going to dwell on uh, details of those, but just want to convey the message that there are a number of different targets uh, within uh, that approach that are in earlier phases of uh, the development. One molecule is nilotinib, which is commercially available drug for treatment of uh, leukemia. And I was ordered to run uh, a phase two uh, study that that we publicly presented. It was not an efficacy study. It was a safety uh, study, but there was no signal of efficacy whatsoever. So our un unanimous con conclusion is that there is no indication to pursue further testing of nilotinib and certainly no indication to take it off our label. So what is my editorial high-level view of this uh, premises versus challenges of synuclein targeting therapeutics? No question about it. The programs are very exciting. This is for the first time that we are targeting underlying biology of the disease. And what is very reassuring is that so far all the studies are demonstrating good safety and tolerability profile. Where the challenges reside, we don't have the measures how to test whether we're delivering enough of the drug and whether the drug is actually reaching what it should be doing in the brain. Uh, development of synuclein uh, imaging modalities would be essential, but as of today, we don't have such. But again, the, pro uh, the programs are very exciting. Now we'll move into the next part of my presentation, which is development of personalized therapeutics and Parkinson's. And you are hearing that term more and more. It came from oncology. It is being uh, approached more and more in other uh, disease states. And what that means is treating the disease not as a whole, but matching the therapy to the underlying biology that is driving the disease in that particular individual. And no question, that's where the field is moving and should be moving. In Parkinson's, we still have a lot to accomplish. However, there are programs in development and specifically genetically targeted therapeutics. And this is not a lecture about genetics of Parkinson's uh, disease. And as all of you have been told, genetic Parkinson's truly single gene responsible for the disease is applicable to only very much minority of the people, five to 10% of the patients. But we are learning tremendously a lot from that small subset of people. And again, that's where the front running uh, drug development for truly personalized approach for that group that carry that particular mutation. So the two genes that I want you to remember about, and the reason for that is, first of all, they are the most common, though again, on the general scheme of things, they're not common. LARC mutation affects approximately 1.5 to 3% of the general PD population. Uh, GBA, the estimates are higher, 7 to 10%, though still uncommon. 
So in the LARC therapeutics, again, for the first time ever, there are early phase drug development uh, program approaching the LARC related uh, mechanisms and a couple different programs are in uh, development. So very exciting uh, to see them moving uh, forward. GBA field is uh, more active and there are a number of different uh, therapeutic approaches in different phases of the development. We're participating in one of those uh, studies, will be involved in another uh, one. So important programs, more data to come. But if we're talking more and more about Parkinson's genetics, I guess all of you are asking the question, should I be tested uh, for uh, uh, Parkinson's related genetic mutations? So the answer is complex, but definitely genetic testing is entering the clinic for one simple reason. If we don't test, we won't know if someone is carrying the mutation, and it's now actionable because there are drug trials that are looking for people with those particular mutations. Obviously, talk to your physician. Genetic counseling is very important because results of the tests, if they are positive or negative, can impact not only you, but your family members. And you need to know that insurance strictly do not cover genetic testing, but luckily, Luckily, there is a number of research programs that are being launched and have been launched. And at the forefront is PD gene uh, study launched by the Parkinson Foundation that offers ge free genetic testing in the research environment to any person with Parkinson's uh, disease. Michael J. Fox has a number of uh, programs. And we at Northwestern have um, a program that is called Biorepository. While the previous ones are uh, are designed to return the results uh, to the participants. We have an ambitious goal to uh, collect DNA samples from every person with Parkinson's seen in our clinic for future research. And a number of you have been approached for those programs. And I'm very excited to inform you that that program has been launched not only at downtown, but at Lake Forest and Central DePage as well. So now coming to the end of my presentation, a lot of people, specifically people with newly diagnosed disease, legitimately are anxious. What does the future hold? How will my disease behave? So a couple high level advisors. Seek expert opinion in a specialized Parkinson's center. The management of Parkinson's is complex and intricate. So it is of value to see an expert specifically in that disease. Parkinson Foundation has a lot of educational materials. Take advantage of them. We have a lot of information on our website. Inquire about clinical trials. And that's why I'm very pragmatic. If you don't participate in the studies, we will not have those new drugs because we won't have sufficient number of participants to test those uh, interventions. Be reassured that we have potent medications to treat Parkinson's symptoms, especially in the early phases of uh, the disease. Talk to your doctors. Exercise is essential and having a positive outlook is important. So speaking of exercise, I'm very excited to tell you that the first phase three study of efficacy of exercise intervention in newly diagnosed people with Parkinson's is actually has been is being launched out of Northwestern by Dr. Corcus. And you probably have heard about that uh, before, but this is a high level design of the study. It's looking for people with newly diagnosed disease, and it's actually testing two active interventions, high intensity intervention versus moderate uh, intensity intervention. So for those of you who are interested, please uh, reach out, we have a flyer about the study. And as I have promised, I will close my presentation with the same slide where I started with. So far, we've been talking about people diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. But as logically you can expect, Parkinson's does not start overnight. The biology of the disease precedes the earliest manifestations by 10 years or probably longer than that. And that's what I've highlighted here. And there is a number of identified risk factors that correspond to the higher risk of development of Parkinson's disease. And as always is said, prevention is better than cure. So for that reason, there is tremendous level of interest to identify that what we call prodromal population and ultimately focused drug development on prevention of the disease. Michael J. Fox Foundation is the leader in uh, that uh, seminal program of 
developing those cohorts of people at risk. And this is the pyramid of uh, the uh, PPMI uh, study that a number of you are familiar with uh, that has set a very ambitious goal to identify 2,000 people with known risk factors for Parkinson's to follow them prospectively to develop the tools and the outcome measures to enable future drug development. So I think my last slide is uh, these are the objectives of the study. And the study is looking for people with newly diagnosed uh, Parkinson's, for first degree relatives of people with Parkinson's above the age of 60, for healthy controls, and people who carry certain risk factors. So all of you sitting in the virtual audience potentially could reach out to your family members, to friends, and ask for them to volunteer. It is a seminal study and very important. So ask us uh, the questions. And with that, I will close. And I always close with that slide. How can you help? First and foremost, have a positive outlook. The field has a number of exciting programs. And together, we will win. It will take time. But the uh, outlook is very optimistic. And those are some uh, other uh, advices uh, that certainly I want to, con to convey uh, to you. And very consistent with that, this is the visual presentation of what I personally very much believe in. And with that, I will close. Thank you for attending this very different virtual program. We certainly hope to see you in person in the near future when it's safe. But in the interim, please stay safe stay healthy. And I also want to highlight that this is actually a very special program. It is the 20th year anniversary of founding of our program. Thank you very much. And with that, I will close. All right, we will now pause for a 10 minute break. So we will return um, our programming at 1120. I want to again, thank the sponsors of today's symposium. Um, of course, our co-host Parkinson's Foundation, Abbott, Medtronic, Supernus, Synovian, Kiowa, Kieran, um, Adamas, Boston Scientific, Lundbeck, and Amniel. During the break, um, we will also be showing an overview of Northwestern's clinical tri research trials, as well as a video from the Parkinson's Foundation. But again, please get up and stretch and do what you need to do to take care of yourself. And again, we will, um, we will address your questions that you've been submitting through the Q&A during the live Q&A portion of today's program, which will be a little after noon. So again, everyone, thank you. And we will return at about 11.20.
My name is Jessica Barch, and I'm the Community Program Manager of the Greater Illinois Chapter for the Parkinson's Foundation. Thank you so much for joining our program today. We will be resuming in just a few minutes, but prior to that, I'd like to share some information with you. The mission of the Foundation is really to make the lives of those better who are affected by Parkinson's disease. Whether you are someone who lives with PD or whether you love someone with PD, we are here for you. And we truly believe that knowledge is power and that our educational programs can help improve the quality of life for someone with Parkinson's. So I'd like to share some information about some upcoming virtual programs with you. At the start of the pandemic, the foundation launched our PD Health at Home initiative. And the idea really was to reduce the isolation in the Parkinson community and bring together the community and have great topics that pertain to you, topics that you find truly helpful. We are proud to say that the foundation is still hosting this program and our focus is on Mondays, Wednesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays. On Mondays, we focus on mindfulness. On Wednesdays, we focus on wellness. And on Fridays, we focus on fitness. If you're interested in learning about any of these programs or registering for them, please visit parkinson.org backslash pdhealth. The Greater Illinois Chapter also has some great programs coming up as well. On October 22nd, we have a program called Let's Talk About It, Symptoms Beneath the Surface. On November 14th, we have a program that is focusing on nutrition. And on December 5th, we have a program that focuses on exercise and creative therapies. I will be sharing some slides with you after this, just so you can see all this information for yourself. Last but not least, we have our yearly fundraiser called movingdaychicago.org. Typically, Moving Day is held in Chicago, where the Parkinson community all comes together, and it's this very inspiring and hopeful event. Things are a little bit different this year because we are hosting it virtually, but we are equally as excited. Moving Day Chicago will be held on Saturday, October 24th. It'll start at 10.30 a.m. Central Time. To learn more or register about Parkinson, about Moving Day, please visit movingdaychicago.org. Thank you so much. We will be sharing some slides with you to show this information. Please enjoy the rest of the program. Wonderful, welcome back everyone. Um, and just a reminder, we have two more presentations this morning before we start our live Q&A panel, which will be a little after um, noon today, um, central time. 
So we will now hear from three different members from Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Catherine Metter is a certified speech language pathologist with over 20 years experience working with both pediatric and adult populations in outpatient settings in various states over the years. She has spent the last 15 years with Shirley Ryan Ability Labs working with patients who develop neurological deficits. Laura Lee Landmeyer is an occupational therapist at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab Northbrook Outpatient Center. Laura is an active clinician whose expertise over the past 30 years has been in neurologic disorders and rehabilitation. And finally, we will hear from Akila Townsend. Akila received her doctorate in physical therapy and has been practicing physical therapy since 2013. She primarily treats in an outpatient setting and is LSVT BIG certified. Hi, I'm Kathy Netter. I'm the speech pathologist at the Northbrook Shirley Ryan Ability Labs location. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of us this weekend, this Columbus Day weekend. And I hope that you will have some great takeaways from our, um, our session today. Today, I will be talking about strategies to help your memory um, for those who are at home in the home environment. Um, what I would like to do is to really focus in on how to help you with some new habits, perhaps, um, to help you start to be able to recall and make life a little easier um, when we are not in the ability to retain things like we used to in the past. So the question now becomes, well, how do we do that? How do I make my brain work a little more effectively and function better? Well, what we do is we learn new habits. And to do that, I'll be talking about some things we do inside of our brain called internal strategies and things that we do outside of our bodies called external strategies. So, well, what does that really mean, internal, external strategies? What I'd like you to think about is when you drive a car. Let's think about this. You get into the car, you turn on the ignition, and the car is running. That is your brain. You're up and running. You've got a heartbeat, you're breathing. But now what we also need is that internal thought process about where are we going. And that is exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about memory and brain and use of some strategies to help keep us focused about where are we going and how do we get there. And so some of those strategies that we can use are something called self-talk. And so what am I talking about? I'm talking about intentionally focusing in and telling myself what it is I'm going to do and where am I going to do it and how am I going to do it. And a lot of times we use our own mouth to help us do that by saying, huh, what am I doing? Where am I going? Out loud. When you do it out loud, it helps us rein in our thoughts and helps us process what we're saying and doing and helps us stay focused on what it is we need to do. Another thing that we like to use in strategy land and in keeping ourselves together are all of our own little tools that we use, such as smartphones, um, helping us keep things straight by keeping uh, calendars, alerts, on our phones and to-do lists in front of our eyeballs. Um, again, when it's in view, we're more apt to use them and to remember something. Okay, we have other visual aids to help keep us focused and on target. Calendars, we all use a calendar. However, you need to place them now where your brain will see them. What does that mean? That means that I don't bury it uh, underneath a book. Um, it means that I have maybe one main calendar that my spouse or caregiver and I share, and it's posted maybe on my refrigerator where I know I pass by every day and I can see it. Or I might have it located with me in my memory station area, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But we have our calendar out and about, and we are going to be um, looking at it frequently to keep ourselves straight. That to-do daily checklist is something else. What am I doing specifically today? Keep it simple. Always put the date at the time, put the date uh, at the top, put time down the side, and very simply, what am I going to do? 9 a.m. pill time, uh, 10 a.m. breakfast, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, uh, shower, or maybe it's getting ready to go to therapy. So what you're doing is just very simply having that listed out. 
What we're also going to do is have you um, put some alerts with it if you need that, that auditory alert, if you can set it on your phone to beep at you at a certain time to remind you, that's wonderful. Um, it could be that um, you are also setting that reminder with a time for travel included. So if you know it's a little harder to get out of bed in the morning and get dressed, it takes a little longer, understand that that's got to be built into the time you're going to put for yourself. It's not that the appointment's at 2 o'clock. It might be that you want to remind yourself, I need to be in the car by 1.30 or 1.15 because it takes me that longer or that much more time to transition into the car and then to drive there and to get out of the car. Another little thing that I like, my clients like to do is to sometimes they're going out into the car and then they have to run back into the house because they've forgotten X, Y, and Z. If that is becoming a problem, you can always list a reminder. Do I have my, and you can list for yourself the things you typically take. Um, so what I have here in front of you is a list of these different items that I'm going to be talking about, but I'm going to have us go to the next slot. And I have down there, before I leave, do I have, and I have listed some random things that I know um, some of my clients have me list, help them list for them. These are things you can just put on a computer, print out, and put on that main door that you're going to walk through into the house or out of the house. For me in my house, I'm walking through the kitchen door. It leads into the garage. So if I had this list to post, I would be putting it on that back side that my eyeballs would be seeing and that I would be glancing at and going down that list to make sure I've got it all with me before I trot out to the car. The next slide is showing you another concept that we all have in our homes, I'm pretty sure. It's called a dumping space. Um, I can attest I have my dumping space. We all have a dumping space where we put things and then they tend to pile up. And it's called clutter. If you're finding that you're having a lot of clutter, you need to declutter those areas that you tend to live in, if possible. Why? Because it confuses your brain. If you're having difficulty being um, focused at home and having memory issues, when you can't pull things out and see them effectively, the brain forgets what's there. So I can guarantee that whatever's at the bottom of that pile, yes, you've forgotten what's there. So we want to declutter our space. The next slide is showing you a memory station concept. This is something you can do in your house to make things less cluttered and more simple. The idea is here that you have your pills, you have your reading glasses, you have a calendar, you have your memory board in front of you, and it's in a simple spot that's not cluttered with stuff, and it's your go-to spot. This will be your memory for the day. What am I going to go do? This simplifies you having to ask someone else, what are we doing at one o'clock? Or where are you going at one o'clock? Um, some of my patients do have that problem as they progress in Parkinson's where they don't hang on to those little bits of information like they used to. Having that visual memory piece there, freely accessed, so that you're not feeling anxious and you can just look and know where to look, frees you up to doing other things. The next slide is showing you when I'm coming in and out of my house, I should be able to empty out my pockets into a short little bin. I don't care if it's a plastic bucket, it can be a lovely little basket, it can be just a spot on a counter. This show represents there's my phone next to something and then here's my bucket and this is the stuff that might be in my pockets, my wallet, my car keys, my pills, um, my to-do list, and my glass case. So that's the idea is I dump everything in one spot and I take off my coat and I hang my coat up, wherever that is, backside of the chair, on the hanger, hook, and you have that spot to dump and unload your pockets all in one area. So walking in and out of my house, I'm unloading my things into a bucket or into a container or into my one area. And then before I'm going out to my appointments, guess what I'm doing? I'm taking it back out, putting it into my, um, into my uh, purse, bag, whatever. Um, and then when I come in, I'm also having that, again, that concept of one spot. Here's my go-to bag, my own personal go-to bag that I lug wherever I'm going. And in there, I call it my pseudo brain. 
Um, but then it's the concept of when I come home, I'm leaving my stuff in my coat on the chair. It's that one spot that's mine. My kids don't get into it. No one moves the stuff um, unless I move it. Um, again, these are things you can adapt in your space at home for your needs. Now, what happens as we progress with some Parkinson's is we sometimes need extra little boosts. And if you need some extra little boosts, you can be talking with your doctors about, your PD doctors, your medical doctors, about getting extra boosts using day rehabilitation services with all three. If you need a little pick-me-up for occupational therapy, PT, and or speech needs, or it could be outpatient services where you just need one or two and a little boost, a little boost to get you up and running and ticking again. Another thing that happens sometimes is dysphagia, swallowing problems. What you want to do on this slide is look through this. Do I have these issues? How do I know if I have a swallowing problem? And there's a list of questions. Have I recently lost weight without trying? Do I tend to avoid drinking liquids? I get the feeling of food being stuck in my throat after I swallow. I tend to drool. I notice food collecting around my gums or pocketing in my cheeks. I do not attend social gatherings as often as I did before. I tend to cough before, during, or after eating or drinking. I often have heartburn or a sore throat. I have trouble keeping food or liquids in my mouth. I clear my throat often. It takes me a long time to eat a meal. If you start saying and checklisting yes to any one of those, it might mean you have a swallowing problem and need to get that re-looked at. Um, so that's where you would also use those outpatient therapy services and or, and or explain to your doctor this is what you're starting to notice. Uh, we don't want you to have any more disability than you have, and it might need a little boost to get you up and running again um, with better swallow. For those people who have a little bit more progression in their Parkinson's disease, more moderate to severe, your communication needs might really be more hampered now, where you're not able to articulate as clearly as you have in the past, and you might need to get a reboost with a speech language pathologist to consult for another way to help you adapt up some communication. This communication um, might need something called adaptive communication. It can be something like yes, no pictures or pictures on an index. It could be using a flip, a flip style type of communication picture. I have some examples of that. Here's two different ways that um, might give you an idea of what I'm talking about where you have words listed and that person who's not able to articulate as clearly as they need, they can just point to what they're, they're thinking. It comes in a variety of styles. It can be a flip book style. It can be something just simple words on a page. There's a variety of ways of doing this. In each case, a speech language pathologist will help assess what your needs are, what you're trying to communicate, along with the caregiver and the, or the family members that you're with and they adapt it up and personalize each of these to your needs. Okay, this is just a quick little preview of what can happen and what we can offer you as far as, you know, ideas of things to be able to do at home, tips. Hopefully this was um, helpful. Hi, I'm Laura Landmeyer, an occupational therapist at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab and welcome to the symposium. I'm honored to be able to speak briefly on a topic that often comes up during rehabilitation. Often I hear two things. One is, I've never heard of occupational therapy. And second, I get too many recommendations and exercises and I really just don't have the time to do all of them. And I agree. So let's talk about some strategies that can help you do and help make it work. First, Occupational therapy is all about uh, developing, restoring, and maintaining meaningful and purposeful activities. It boils down to what matters to you, and that's whether you're the person with Parkinson's disease or the caregiver. So what's your goal? What is meaningful to you? Examples might be with this tremor, I have trouble eating and I don't want to be a messy eater. 
or, you know, my wife has to, or my husband has to help me get dressed, and it's embarrassing. So my goal is to be able to dress myself. Or perhaps, you know, my fingers just are not working as well, and I can't email my grandchildren, and that's really important to me, especially during this pandemic time. So it's a mindset and a focus. What are the exercises or techniques that help you achieve your goals or get you closer to achieving your goals? Focus on what is purposeful and try to embed the exercises and techniques into the task or routine that you're doing, rather than seeing it as something extra that I have to work into my day. How do you make it smooth and transition? An example might be the big hands um, to help wake up those fingers and get them to do those, those smaller tasks or temporarily reduce that tremper, tremor. So a big hand is first making a fist and then big open fingers, no wimpy ones. Gonna do five to 10 big hands. Right before you try the button, zip, write, type on the computer or any other small matter task. That happens, helps many of my um, clients and patients that I see. Thinking about what adaptive equipment. You might have a closet full if you have had an occupational therapist. But thinking about which adaptive equipment work. Is it a reacher? Is it a built up pen that I can get my hand around better to write? Maybe a larger diameter fork or a weighted spoon to help me eat a little bit less methylly and put it where you can find it. It maybe you need two in two different locations so you don't have to spend time where is it and then you don't use it. Also think about preparation exercises. For example, I've had someone that found it very useful to do big arms overhead before putting on their shirt in the morning. Just reaching overhead five times, get those joints going and then punching the arm through the sleeve, the neck sleeve, and pulling it over. So it, they could put on their shirt a lot faster and efficiently and not need help. Um, maybe verbalizing. Maybe you need to verbalize those steps. Punch right, punch left, overhead, to generate that energy to get that shirt on or whatever task you're gonna do. What exercise helps me do it? And organizing. Another example is someone who, you know, I get up earlier than my spouse and I want to make my coffee right first thing in the morning. I don't want to have to wait. But they were having trouble getting the parts together. So labeling the coffee maker with color codes or maybe numbers to get the right sequence and help and perhaps even setting out the supplies in order and leaving them there so it doesn't take so much time and effort. And then thinking about structure because you're important and it's time to make time, you know, so make time for yourself. Put some structure in your day, organize a little bit because the truth is organized people do get more done. Routine and habit free up time and energy. And if you have that extra time and energy, you can do what matters to you. It's easier to recharge that energy battery if you take frequent short breaks rather than get to empty and be down for the count for the rest of the day. And apply those principles throughout the week. If it's, I had a good day, so I did all of this stuff, guess what, you're gonna pay for it the next day or two. So pace those bigger activities, not just today I feel good, so I'm going for it. Plan it and work it into your schedule. So thank you for listening, and I hope you did find some of these strategies helpful for you so that you can do what matters to you. Hi, my name is Akila Townsend, and I'm just going to go over some rehabilitation strategies at the home and ways to optimize those strategies for in the home. Oops. So for today's agenda, um, we are going to review briefly um, non-motor symptoms, go over some mindfulness ideas, and then review motor symptoms again, and review some exercises and its relation to Parkinson's. 
Some of the non-symptoms of uh, the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease are lifted, or listed above. Um, we often focus on Parkinson's disease, their motor symptoms, and though this disease does affect movement, there are some non-motor symptoms. Um, these non-motor symptoms are not limited to the mood disorders, which can include depression, anxiety, irritability, cognitive changes, and difficulties with attention and planning, hallucinations and delusions, orthostatic hypotension, which is low blood pressure with positional changes, um, sleep disorders, constipation, pain, fatigue, and loss of sense of smell. Um, all these can play a role on disease management and the effects on quality of life. So today, I wanted to briefly shed light on mindfulness as a method of managing the anxiety, so some of those mood disorders. Um, mindfulness would be defined as um, where one focuses on being intensely aware of what they are sensing and feeling in the moment without interpretation or judgment. Um, and so um, you are, it's reported that actually as many as, as many as two out of five people with Parkinson's disease will experience some form of anxiety, um, whether it's generalized anxiety or anxiety attacks or social avoidance. Um, being at home more because of COVID-19 may further exacerbate the occurrence of such anxiety issues. Um, and so mindfulness um, is an intervention that can actually aid in reducing anxiety by providing skills to cope with stressful situations caused by physical, emotional, and psychological triggers. So simply put, you want to be able to pr be present and aware of where you are and what you're doing. Um, so during this time, it can be a little a little difficult to stay positive during this time with like, the politics and the social unrest um, and then compounded with isolation because of the pandemic, I think it would be really important to kind of work on this mindfulness and being present. Um, this picture right here is just a representation of being mindful. So um, mindful when on the right hand side is you're enjoying one moment at a time or a task at a time and you're being um, focused on the now. And you can see the dog's thought process, it's nice and not distracted and overwhelmed. Being mindful is when you are thinking too much or you're overwhelmed with your thinking and you're focusing more on the future. Um, so we wanna be on the right hand side being mindful and focusing on being present in the here and now. Um, how can you incorporate mindfulness into your life? Um, so I would say it's simple and you would just want to start small. So there's different things called mindful minutes where you introduce short meditation minutes throughout the day. Um, during this time, you can focus your attention on your breathing um, and nothing else. You take one thing at a time instead of trying to multitask. So we want to do one focused action at a time. Um, and you want to be aware of your thoughts and emotions and how you're feeling physically and emotionally. Um, I put on here wearable devices because sometimes they can be a distraction for your mindfulness, but sometimes they can actually help you because you can do breathing applications and you can track those minutes that you are being mindful. Um, there are mindfulness apps. There's the Calm app. There's mindfulness coach apps. Um, these apps just in general provide guidance on how to do those meditations and those breathing um, apps. Um, there's also on the Parkinson's Foundation, they have Mindful Mondays, which also gives you options on um, being able to be more mindful in, in life in general. Um, exercise in Parkinson's disease. Um, of course, I put on here that um, increasing your physical activity to at least two and a half hours a week can slow decline in quality of life. And then you want to know why you should perform these exercises. Um, Parkinson's can affect memory, attention, and concentration and decision making. And it also has a connection with depression and anxiety, which we've mentioned before. And these factors um, impact the overall health of people with Parkinson's disease. So exercise has been proven to have a positive effect on improving self-efficacy and confidence and quality of life. So the current recommendation is actually two and a half hours a week, which is 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic exercises. And the routine should also include aerobic, balance, flexibility, and strengthening programs as well. Um, for your aerobic exercises, um, your exercises should achieve a moderate to vigorous activity level. On the next slide, I'm going to actually show you a scale, but this is just to briefly go over some of those exercises that would be good recommendations for that aerobic component. 
um, things that we need to look out for when we're doing aerobic exercise. And when I say aerobic, we're kind of getting that heart rate up and we're breathing hard, we're kind of getting a little sweaty there. That's where we're, that's the target that we're going for. But some things we need to look out for um, are orthostatic hypotension, um, medications, as um, certain medications uh, may require that there's a certain time frame before we can um, begin exercises, whether it be like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And there's also certain medications that manage blood pressure that will block your heart rate. Um, these medications are known as beta blockers. Um, other precautions we need to be aware of also are cardiovascular um, comorbidities. So examples of aerobic exercise are jogging, walking, swimming, biking, fast-paced walking, and hiking. The scale that I just I'm showing you right now is um, the that's the Borg RPE scale, so it's the rate of perceived exertion. So it's important to know what exercise quantify as moderate intensity exercises because intensity does matter. Um, and so people with Parkinson's are able to, we want to be able to have you guys monitor your intensity level either based on the heart rate calculations or by using this scale here. Um, so again, like I said before, certain medications may blunt your heart rate, and so calculations using your heart rate are not going to be so based on this scale, which is from 6 to 20, um, the blue is going to be that we are doing little to no effort. That's not the zone that we want to be in. Um, the green zone is the zone that we want to be in, which is between a 12 and 16 out of 20. Um, and this is how you should feel with your exercises. So the wordage they use is somewhat hard or hard exercises. The red is what we don't want to be in as well. And this is see, you know, feeling like you working your hardest ever. Um, and this is a zone that we also don't want to be in. Um, the strengthening exercises, the recommendation is to continue, uh, perform those two to three times a week. Um, as we also notice that weakness can be noted in um, patients with Parkinson's. So um, precautions need to be taken when beginning strengthening programs. And so for recommendations on weight, on form, and repetitions, those are things we need to be aware of. And so seeing a physical therapist can help address this. Um, examples of some simple exercises to improve strength that do not include equipment are sit-to-stands, heel raises, being able to do step-ups. Um, your strengthening program should address lower extremity, upper extremity, and core and trunk strength. Exercises, of course, can be done in sitting, standing, and laying down depending on your abilities. Um, our flexibility exercises, they should be performed three to four times a week. Um, but daily is, of course, better. Stretches should be held between um, 10 to 30 seconds and perform three to four repetitions each stretch for improved flexibility. Um, and we always see a correlation with flexibility, improved felt flexibility with balance, bed mobility, and with turning. Um, again, these flexibility exercises should incorporate chest wall stretches, your shoulder stretches, hamstring, calves, low back, and neck. Um, and then posture is also important, so stretching of the trunk and the shoulders is one of the reasons why those are important. Um, balance exercises, the other component of those for the uh, front. These examples are amplitude-based approaches, so you may have heard of LSBT, big movements, um, power moves, dancing, rock steady boxing, tai chi, and yoga. All of these are good examples on how to um, incorporate balance into your daily life. So um, in order to prevent or reduce fall risk, as Parkinson's um, people are often two times as likely to fall compared to older populations, it's important to kind of address this during your exercise routine. Um, impairments in balance can be detected in early stages of Parkinson's. So of course, the earlier the better that we are incorporating these balance exercises into your routine, the better. And that is it. So um, thank you for listening. And thank you so much to the rehab team. Our final speaker this morning is Charlinda Brashear. Charlinda is a licensed clinical social worker who has spent her professional life working with adult and geriatric populations in a medical setting. She has worked as a hospital social worker at Northwestern for over four years before joining the Parkinson's disease and movement disorders team in January of this year. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Shailinda, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker with the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Program here at Northwestern. As a regular part of my job, I have the privilege of providing psychotherapy and counseling for patients in our downtown clinic and other locations through telehealth. Frequently, I help people master coping skills for dealing with anxiety and depression or just adjusting to a new diagnosis like Parkinson's. Today, I'd like to speak with you about a coping skill that you can practice at home um, and it will help with stress and anxiety. And that coping skill is gratitude. Studies have found that a regular, deliberate gratitude practice can be very helpful with anxiety, depressive feelings, and just managing stressors. So that is the topic of today's presentation. So now that I'm sharing my screen, I'd like to show you. Um, today's presentation is titled, The Importance of Practicing Gratitude During and Beyond Times of Crisis. And the current pandemic um, is definitely something that counts as a crisis. It's caused an unprecedented disruption in our daily lives. Many people are feeling even more isolated. And that's important because if you have a movement disorder such as Parkinson's, you may already have some mobility challenges. And something like the COVID crisis can cause you to maybe feel more isolated. Um, things that you used to do might be closed or they've gone virtual and, and particularly if you have any trouble with the technology. So it is important during times of crisis in particular to use coping skills to help keep your mental health the best that it can be. And also even during times when it's not necessarily a crisis, I think paying attention to our mental health and instituting a practice like gratitude can still be very helpful um, and has a lot of benefits. It's a form of self-care that helps us focus on the positive aspects of daily life, which is really important in reducing stress and also getting better sleep and just staying healthier in general. So let's talk about gratitude and positive psychology. In positive psychology, researchers try to understand how people can lead healthy, happy, and more fulfilling lives. Um, in other words, doing things that they want to do and, and being truly fulfilled, um, having a, a sense of purpose. And positive psychology has also long recognized that a daily gratitude practice is a way to boost happiness and well-being. And I think that's key to talk about is um, Frequently, consistently, you know, daily is ideal, and also deliberately, meaning taking time to really truly think about those things that we're grateful for um, with intention, um, meaning, meaning on, on purpose or in a deliberate way. Um, and research indicates that those who practice that have lower self-reported levels of depression and anxiety, um, when they're using scales like the, the PHQ-9 or the GAD-7, um, those self-report scales for depressive and anxious feelings, um, patients that are regularly practicing gratitude tend to report lower levels of depression and anxiety. Um, additional research also indicates that practicing gratitude can have a positive impact on your physical health as well as your mental health. And we'll talk about that next. So there was a study um, in 2015 on um, patients that had uh, asymptomatic heart failure and were practicing gratitude. Um, and that study found that uh, gratitude not only helps improve how we feel, but it also can help have a healthier heart. Um, it was also associated with improved sleep and less fatigue. So per the study, um, patients that were giving uh, thanks for positive aspects of life um, did have these improved outcomes. And I'd like to read you this quote. We found that more gratitude in these patients was associated with better mood, better sleep, less fatigue, and lower levels of inflammatory biomarkers related to cardiac health. So as you can see, this has been studied not only from the perspective of psychologically having benefits, uh, but also physically even, um, lowering stress, lowering cortisol, lowering biomarkers for um, heart health um, has been shown with a daily gratitude practice. Um, 
So let's talk about this. How can we practice gratitude? How can you incorporate this into your life? Um, and the way that I most frequently recommend or talk to with patients is through journaling, gratitude journaling. And now what that can mean for someone with Parkinson's, you know, maybe you have a hand tremor or it's just more challenging for you to physically put pen to paper. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't participate in this as well. You absolutely can. Um, there are apps. Um, some people use their computer, their phone. Um, some people dictate to their phone um, and, and make a little daily um, gratitude list or reminder. So the important way, the important thing rather is not the medium or, or exactly how you're doing it. It's more important to be consistent and intentional with the practice than it is whether you're writing in a physical journal or using um, your laptop or your smartphone. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to share some, some purpose and benefits. Um, I know we talked about a lot of them, but the goal really, the primary goal is to focus on positive experiences um, and people and things in our lives that provide joy and, and positivity. Um, so among these benefits, it reduces stress again, increases happiness, and actually has been shown to improve self-esteem. Um, and one app that I recommend if, if you ever have any difficulty with uh, writing it down on paper journal or just if you're someone who prefers uh, to use technology in that way, it's called Five Minutes of Gratitude. It's free. It's available on the App Store, um, the Apple App Store if you happen to have an iPhone. Um, and it's in list format. So um, if writing is an issue, um, you can easily type on your phone or more easily, I should say. Um, but it also kind of gives you a prompt, you know, where it's listing three things. And we'll talk about that a little later, but three things you're grateful for and also setting an intention for the day, which is um, kind of a component or a complement of gratitude is, you know, when you wake up, you know, if your automatic thought is, um, well, what do I want from this day? What's, what's my intention? What positive things am I going to engage in or, or, or get out of my day? Um, that can really help and set the tone for the day and also help with just, again, feeling that, that, that positivity and, and seeing a more balanced view. This is definitely not about ignoring reality or, or not acknowledging that there are negative things. It's more about balance. And, and seeing that, yes, the, there are these negative things, but there also are positive things. Um, and not letting you know, our tendency as human beings, which is natural tendency to more easily see the negative, we're, we're now balancing that out with seeing those positive things as well so that we get a kind of a full view of ourselves and our day and, and the things in our lives. So tips for gratitude journaling. Um, daily, I do believe is best, and it's been shown in the literature, but at least two times a week, particularly if you're getting started, it's a new practice. Um, I think just making the effort, you know, to, to do it at least two times a week and to write a detailed entry about one thing that you're grateful for. This could be a person, it could be a good meal, your job, um, really anything that comes to mind. And that's where it's so individual and so personal. You know, something that I'm grateful for might not be something that you're grateful for. So this is, again, something that you take deliberate time to practice and to really think about in your life, what are those positive things? What are those things that keep you going that you're grateful for and, and that you enjoy? Um, and also not rushing to write down the first thing that comes to your mind to kind of get it done for the day, but really spending some time you know, they, this average, you know, 10 to 20 minutes um, just thinking about um, and really explaining in detail what it is that you're grateful for. Um, so, for example, not just saying I'm, you know, grateful for my, um, my partner, but I'm really grateful that my partner and I were able to take some time um, yesterday and, and take a walk through the park and and you know, watch the sunset, or you know, whatever it is that, that you did. But just ma the more detail, the more specific that you can be to really evoke that memory, and and really think about why you're grateful for those things that you are. Um, the more benefit has been shown to get from this practice, um, and also writing about people as opposed to things. 
tends to be more powerful. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't be grateful, you know, for, you know, your home or your garden or, you know, anything like that. But, but also consider, you know, if you're using the prompt, for example, um, three good things, um, try making one of those um, relational or, or about a relationship or a, a person, a friend, a family member, someone that you're grateful for, um, in addition to things that you're grateful for. Um, and if this is harder to remember, uh, sometimes I recommend putting it in your way. And, and what I mean by that is, if you're using a traditional journal, maybe put it on your nightstand so that it's right there, it's convenient for you, and in the morning or the afternoon, whenever you like to do your journaling, it's right there so you don't have to go out of your way to remember to do this practice. And also, um, you know, if your phone, usually that's with you, but maybe setting an alarm, you know, if you decide, okay, you know, in the morning, I, I want to get up, take my shower, and then spend a few minutes doing my gratitude practice with my coffee, whatever works for you, but maybe setting an alarm if, if you need to, to help remember and remind you to, you know, do that practice. Um, and really, that's, that's it. Um, it's, it's a rather relatively straightforward practice, which is what I like about it as a coping skill. Um, it's not really expensive to start. You don't have to go out and buy a fancy journal um, or a phone. Um, you know, you can use whatever tools are available. Really what matters is being consistent and deliberate. So again, just making sure that you're regular about doing a gratitude practice and also that you really take time to think about what you're grateful for and balance um, any negativity, you know, from the news, from, you know, 2020, COVID, anything like that. Try and balance that with also seeing the positive and, and to get that full view and, and to help keep your mental health, you know, in the best um, frame that it can be. Um, so thank you for listening. And if you want more resources on this, um, I've referenced the article about um, heart health and uh, gratitude practice, but also therapistaid.com. They have some really great worksheets. They're free of charge. And they're kind of like writing prompts for the gratitude practice. So um, the app is also free. Uh, and there's a paid version with a few extra features, but I, I don't think those are necessary. Again, I think this is something that it's simple, but it's powerful. And just getting started, you know, realizing there's not a wrong way to do this. If you're setting an intention and you're willing to just think daily about the things that you're grateful for, then I think that you'll get um, something out of this that's gonna be positive. So thank you very much for your time today. And um, please let me know if you have any questions at all. Thank you. Wonderful. And I just want to thank, um, again, all our presenters today. We greatly appreciate your time and expertise. And we're now going to transition to our live um, physician and clinician Q&A panel and be able to answer the questions that have been coming in throughout today's webinar. So just give us a moment while we get all of the panelists on the screen. So I'm going to start today's Q&A panel by, again, introducing our panelists. So we have um, Dr. Danny Vega, Dr. Ray Dorsey, and Sherlinda Brashear, whom you heard give presentations already this morning. And also joining us for today's panel is Dr. Jennifer Goldman, who is the Section Chief of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Program at Sherlin, Shirley Ryan Ability Lab and Sherry Marchbanks, who is a physical therapist and the program manager at Shirley Ryan's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Program. So I'm gonna begin by asking the questions that have been coming in throughout the presentation. Uh, we're gonna answer as many as we can. We have a lot of questions, so I think unfortunately we're not gonna be able to get to all, but the good thing is is that we will be compiling. Um, with all the questions submitted, we're gonna be compiling a response sheet that will be um, sent out again in the follow-up email in the next week or two. So rest assured, if it's not answered today, it will be answered eventually. So with that, let's get started with some questions. 
Um, so I think this would be for Dr. Bega or one of the physicians on the, on the panel. Um, so there's a question asking for clarification on whether or not Parkinson's disease ex um, affects the lifespan. I think someone, um, there was mention of it being a terminal disease. Um, so just asking some clarification on that. So uh, I think uh, that was brought up in one of the talks. Um, Parkinson's disease is a, it's a disease of aging. And so as people get older, we see, uh, we know that obviously there's, uh, at some point people die as they get older and Parkinson's disease progresses as you get older. Um, and so when we, when we look at causes of death in Parkinson's disease, we usually think about things like pneumonias. Uh, we think about falls. Um, and, and whether you relate those directly to the Parkinson's or to other factors related to aging is tricky. Um, when you look at data on causes of death, it's also depending on how a physician, you know, filled out a form in terms of what they choose to put as a cause of death, um, whether they choose to put Parkinson's disease or something more proximal like a pneumonia. Um, and so to, to some extent you're splitting hairs, but in general, the way I talk to my patients about it is, um, it's a disease that slowly progresses over many, many, many years, and in fact, decades for many people. And so uh, when we think about cutting your life shorter, it's not really something that we, we uh, emphasize as a, as a part of the disease. Um, and because we know that people can live with it for so many years um, and into a very old age. So, so I really don't think about it that way. Thank you so much, Dr. Vega. So um, I think the next question is going to be for Dr. Goldman and Sherry, more we have focused, um, or someone with advanced disease rather. So what can be done to treat someone with more advanced disease who has difficulty walking? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll start with answering that. Um, a lot of times as Parkinson's progresses, we see um, people's ability to learn change. Um, so we have to modify the techniques that we treat somebody um, with more advanced disease. One example of this is utilizing things like external cues. Um, instead of somebody having to think and sort of cue themselves to step bigger um, or be more intentional about their walking, we have to provide them or set up the environment so that it does so without having to say, take bigger steps, stop shuffling, things like that, because so much input can be really overwhelming. Um, and so a lot of times there are environmental modifications that we can make. Um, consistency with cues. Um, so a lot of what we do from later stages um, is caregiver training um, and some compensatory strategies so that um, care partners and caregivers don't feel like they're constantly nagging the person, but they can work together to figure out, um, work together with a therapist to figure out what cues work most optimally. How can we set up our environment to promote those things um, so that I'm not constantly having to say those reminders. Um, I th think there's also benefit to, um, you know, getting into a regular routine that's feasible. So maybe walking isn't part of your regular exercise routine, but doing other forms of exercise is feasible. Um, and then again, figuring out ways to safely ambulate and walk um, when that needs to happen. Um, so my best thought is, um, you know, trying to simplify the commands and cues that you're giving to somebody. Um, work with a therapist to see what works best, see if there are maybe assistive devices that might help, or if an assistive device hinders you more, which is the case with some patients. Um, so uh, any of our therapy locations, or there are plenty of other great therapists who treat people with Parkinson's as well. Um, you can find specialty therapists, excuse me, therapists who have specialty in neurology um, on the American Physical Therapy Association website, or APTA, um, so that they would be close to you. Did you have anything to add, Dr. Goldman? Sure, thanks so much. And uh, thanks, Sherry, for your really thorough answer. Um, and I, I would just add that it's so important to assess rehabilitation strategies over the course of Parkinson's from early to advanced stages. And there is always something that can be done. It may look different at different stages from early to later stages, but really working with the rehabilitation team can help identify what those strategies might be for you as the individual person 
living with Parkinson's and your care partner. And then of course, there's so many aspects that can go into walking and gait, freezing of gait, falls, home environment. So it's really great to have a team to be able to look at all those, all those features and look at the home as we talked about rehab strategies at home and look at that environment. So thanks. Thank you both so much. Um, Dr. Dorsey, your presentation really highlighted environmental risk, um, environmental risks. And so I'm wondering, you know, compared to aging and genetic risk factors, how important are environmental risk factors for the majority of people who develop Parkinson's disease? Uh, so thank you very much for the question. First of all, it's delighted to be part of this distinguished panel and especially delighted to be uh, participating in a symposium with lots of people who've been benefiting from the leadership of Dr. Tanya Samuni. Um, so rather than just thinking of Parkinson's disease as a disease of aging, I like to think of Parkinson's disease as a disease of environmental and to a lesser extent genetic factors. We've known for over 100 years, over 100 years, that 85% of people with Parkinson's disease do not have a family history of the disease. We know in 2020 of all the genes identified, all the genes identified over the last 20 some years, that 85% of people with Parkinson's disease have no mutation in any of them. We have known for over 20 years that numerous environmental factors, including pesticides and industrial chemicals are linked to Parkinson's disease. We have known for over 20 years that these same pesticides when given to animals reproduce the behavioral and pathological features of the Parkinson's disease. If we continue to ignore these facts, we will continue to cultivate the next generation of Parkinson's disease, which will be twice as big as the current generation of Parkinson's disease. 100 people will die with Parkinson's disease today if we continue to look at Parkinson's disease as just a disease of aging, we will be wrong, we'll be misguided, we'll miss an opportunity to prevent subsequent generations from uh, pre preventing subsequent generations from developing this debilitating disease. We must change our ways. Thank you so much, Dr. Darcy. As a follow-up question, um, again, when we think about environmental exposures, you mentioned pesticides or heavy metals. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how long after that exposure or for what length of time, if that affects the development of Parkinson's? I think the great way to look at this is smoking. Um, so in 1920s, the number of lung cancer deaths in the United States due to smoking was almost zero. It just didn't exist. It was considered a once in a lifetime oddity that all the doctors and medical students would gather around because they never thought they would see it. Then cigarettes were introduced into the United States and it took 25 years after the introduction of cigarettes to see a corresponding increase in lung cancer. So you don't smoke a cigarette and develop a lung cancer the next day, nor do, nor, and only 10% of people who smoke cigarettes ever develop lung cancer. There's a lag, it takes time. As Dr. Vega was indicating, that's why it's associated with uh, longevity and aging. If everyone died at 40, no one would develop lung cancer and no one would develop Parkinson's disease because it takes years for the disease to play out. It takes years for the symptoms to progress. Um, so I think, it's, I think the exposure could be, and this is a more hypothesis than fact, the exposure could be as soon as uh, people are nursing. We know that pesticides are found in the milk of nursing mothers. We know that those pesticides then are passed on to newborns. We know that newborns have a developing and growing brain. We know that newborns and, uh, uh, have less protective mechanisms. My suspicion is that many people gather these exposures early in their life, probably through uh, early adulthood and, and possibly beyond, and that years of exposure uh, to these pesticides or industrial chemicals from occupational exposure or from contaminated groundwater that's happening in DuPage, that happened in DuPage County, you know, where some of your individuals are residing. Uh, will then manifest themselves out years or decades later. Thank you so much for that thoughtful answer. Um, so this is more about um, symptomatic uh, medications or management. So I would pose this um, you know, to the physicians on the call. So if a person on levodopa develops mild dyskinesia, can these movements go away with a decrease in levodopa? Or what are some other ways of addressing dyskinesias? I'm happy to take that. Um, so dyskinesias uh, certainly would be reduced by lowering of carbidopa levodopa. Uh, however, that's not uh, necessarily uh, the way we would approach it for, for most patients because the levodopa that we use is, is uh, helpful for treating most of the motor problems related to Parkinson's disease. Um, and so most patients with Parkinson's disease really rely on that levodopa replacement to have 
good high quality function day to day. And it's a very effective treatment uh, for, for many of the motor symptoms. And so simply reducing the levodopa while that can reduce the excessive movements referred to as dyskinesias can leave someone feeling under medicated uh, in terms of their ability to perform day-to-day -day life and uh, exercise and, and so forth. So we don't wanna leave people under medicated uh, simply to reduce the dyskinesias. And so we're often in people who are struggling with both uh, dyskinesias and, and you know, needing that medication, uh, we're looking for other strategies. Uh, sometimes we'll add a medication specifically to target uh, the dyskinesias, uh, which we do have uh, uh, medications that do that. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll just adjust the way the levodopa is given, uh, either the formulation or the, uh, the frequency in which it's given. Uh, we might lower the dose, but increase the frequency. And so it's really an individualized process in terms of how we manage it. Certainly not a one size fits all approach. Um, and, and then when we get to the uh, patients who are struggling even with, with changes that we make with medications, uh, we, we have advanced therapies, specifically surgical therapies, that can be very effective in controlling motor symptoms uh, while allowing for less medication. Uh, and, and specifically, the, the classic uh, way we do that is, is deep brain stimulation surgery, um, which is a whole topic in itself to discuss, but which can control motor symptoms uh, without, uh, while allowing for less oral medications. Um, so there are a lot of ways to deal with that, but it's, a, it's one of the main things we deal with kind of day to day as we're managing patients. Thank you so much. Um, so this is a, the next question is a very large topic and, um, but a very important one. So I'm going to open it up to um, all the panelists. Um, can you address um, some of the medications geared towards depression and anxiety for Parkinson's patients? Again, I know this is a very broad topic, but I'm wondering if anyone can touch on this briefly, um, again, in terms of um, any the medications to address the anxiety and depression. Sure, I'm happy to start this off and thank you. I'm really glad someone asked about some of the non-motor and neuropsychiatric symptoms here today. Uh, I'll also point out the, a plug that today is actually World uh, Mental Health Day, so it's extremely appropriate to start some of those conversations. Uh, and again, I think this is an area that will take a team approach. So we have other members on the, on the team who play a role, some of whom are here today. But depression and anxiety can be common in Parkinson's disease. It can occur throughout the course, even as an early pre-motor feature going back several years before someone develops motor symptoms and can occur at, at different points in times, whether there may be changes in uh, uh, physical function or, or other abilities. Depression and anxiety can also be treatable in Parkinson's. Uh, there are very good medicines out there that are well recognized in the general population. So not necessarily specific for Parkinson's, but can be used commonly thought of as some of those like SSRIs or SNRIs just to name a few. And as uh, Dr. Bega mentioned about some of the, the dyskinesias and motor fluctuations, people can sometimes experience depression or anxiety as non-motor fluctuations, in which case we might address the timing of their medication. And just to speak on the team approach, this is really where uh, it's great to be able to work with psychologists, neuropsychologists, social workers, yay, uh, on, the, on the panel, and psychiatrists as well. So I'll turn it over to them to make some comments as well. And I'd like to speak to that just a little bit. And thank you, Dr. Goldman, for recognizing um, World Mental Health Day. I think that's so important. Um, and just realizing that not just medication, but also um, talk therapy, you know, having someone to talk to, realizing that this is not something that you're going through alone, that it is quite common and treatable, that, that anxiety and depression, you know, there are strategies and coping skills and ways to manage those symptoms, both with medication and without, that can really improve the quality of your life. So if I could say one thing, it would just be for people to please reach out. Please let your physician, your family, someone know that this is going on, that you're having some mental health struggles, and we can certainly help with that.
Thank you so much. As a quick follow-up question, because we know that apathy is often a common non-motor symptom too. Is there a specific medication or way to address that specific symptom of apathy, or would the medications um, that commonly depress, uh, address rather the depression and anxiety um, also be the ones to address apathy? I'd be happy to start that start that off. Um, so apathy is uh, represents often the the um, a decrease in motivation or what we consider goal directed behavior. So it's a little bit like the get up and go to want to do things, um, whether they're uh, hobbies or exercise or other activities, and it's something that can be common in Parkinson's, uh, and it can affect both people, not only the person living with Parkinson's, but also their care partner and family who kind of want to, you know, might want to go out and do something and the person with Parkinson's may not have that same, same desire uh, or love degree of wanting to do something. Uh, apathy can be a bit tricky to treat and represents an area where we certainly need better medications and better understanding and better therapies. But there are a number of medicines that can be considered as we think about apathy. Um, some of those might fall in dopaminergic classes of medicines. Some of those might fall in antidepressants that we just spoke about a little earlier. And then some of those may also fall into some of the cognitive medicines that we, we consider. And then uh, it depends on what, what else might be going on with that particular person. But there are also strategies working with, uh, I think, our social work team, psychology, rehab professionals, including occupational therapy, to, to come up with strategies to, to cope with this and to plan and to look at energy um, conservation and fatigue and when to do activities when people are at their best. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that there's no um, like dietitians or nutritionists on the call, but one question is, are there any benefits to whole food plant-based eating or any other specific diets um, for Parkinson's disease? Um, I can start, I don't know if Dr. Uh, Dorsey wants to comment from a uh, standpoint of um, kind of environmental issues, but the, uh, unfortunately there aren't good diet studies uh, done uh, in Parkinson's disease. It's difficult to do studies of diet because it's hard to control a lot of the factors related to diet when you're doing a good high quality study. But what we, what we know is uh, it's probably not a good idea to have a, very, a diet that's all of one kind of thing or all of another kind of thing. And, and you know, a well-balanced, healthy diet is, 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 is important. But some of the things that are particularly useful to pay attention to in a diet is, is thinking about what's healthy for the brain. Um, and a lot of this we learn from animal models of Parkinson's disease is that things like antioxidants, things that are, are anti-inflammatory could be protective in the brain. Um, and uh, examples of that would be things like omega-3 fatty acids, things that have a lot of uh, antioxidants, things like colorful fruits and vegetables. Um, uh, that is gonna, in general, uh, we think be protective in reducing inflammation in the brain and the cells in the brain um, and uh, remove some of the damaging particles that can be uh, bad for cells in the brain. Now, has anyone proven that, that, be, that doing that in people um, uh, clearly makes a difference. Uh, no, we're struggling to actually have good evidence for that in animal models. Um, animals that have received antioxidants or things like coenzyme Q10, we actually have, have seen effects uh, on uh, affecting the course of the disease. But in humans, uh, we haven't seen those specific outcomes. Um, but you know, healthier diets in general are going to lead to less medical comorbidities, also, which is uh, you know less things like diabetes. Uh, heart disease, which is going to make the disease easier to treat in general. Um, and so thinking about that, just a thoughtful, healthy diet that's high in antioxidants um, is, is often what we'll recommend. Working with a nutritionist, though, on, uh, you know, calories and more nuances is really useful for, uh, oftentimes we'll refer people, actually, there are uh, dietitians and nutritionists both at Northwestern and at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab that we utilize when people are really wanting more fine-tuned recommendations with regard to what to eat. So uh, just a couple things. So this is the book that we wrote and, uh, you know, it offered me the time to read a lot of the literature, including the literature from Dr. Carly Tanner, who did her training at Rush University, where I think both Dr. Vega and Dr. Goldman spent a lot of time. 
and perhaps some of my other colleagues. Uh, so uh, as Dr. Baker rightly indicates, these studies are really hard to do, but that doesn't mean that they're not important. Um, so uh, uh, a Mediterranean diet has been shown to decrease your risk of likely developing Parkinson's disease and may be beneficial for those with the disease. So just as Dr. Baker indicated, diets high in fruits and vegetables, low in animal products. Um, more generally, if, uh, if you had Parkinson's disease, uh, do you really want to expose yourself to more pesticides that are nerve toxins, some of which uh, are known to uh, contribute, if not cause, uh, Parkinson's disease? So since writing the book, uh, I buy a lot more organic. I'm privileged to be able to afford to do so, but I wash all my, my fruits and vegetables, including my blueberries and my what I blackberries uh, this morning with water and a, and a you know, pesticide soap to remove that fat soluble pesticide. There was one study in Hawaii uh, detailed in this book in which uh, heptachlor, a pesticide contaminated milk uh, among people in Hawaii. Individuals who were high milk drinkers in Hawaii were more likely to develop Parkinson's disease. When they looked at their brains, they had fewer dopamine producing nerve cells and they found the residues of that heptachlor pesticide in their brains. They had the smoking gun right there. We continue to ignore these things. We continue to let pesticides like Paraquat uh, be used in increasing amounts uh, in the United States despite 100,000 people signing a petition to ban it. Uh, use of the pesticides increased about 20% from 2016 to 2017, doubled in the last 10 years, tripled in the last 25. This continues to be sprayed on the uh, farmlands in uh, Illinois and Wisconsin, breeding the next generation of Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Dr. Vega and Dr. Dorsey. Um, and again, I just want to appreciate how many wonderful questions we that we had come in. And I wish that we, you know, had all the time in the world to address them. But again, rest assured, if we did not get to them, we will address them in a post email follow up. And so with that, I'm going to pose the last question due to time. I want to be respectful of all the panelists and of course, all the attendees on this call. Um, so this is going to be geared towards research. Um, how can patients, like what's the easiest way to access clinical trials and are there clinical trial opportunities for someone with more advanced disease? I can take that. So um, we have, uh, as you may have seen scrolling through during the break, we have a lot of uh, trials uh, that are recruiting right now at Northwestern, um, at Shirley Ryan. Um, we, uh, for all stages of disease, we have, um, trials recruiting for people who are early in the disease, uh, who are not on medications yet for some of the disease modifying uh, uh, trials. Um, we have trials for uh, drugs to control symptoms um, with people who have more uh, advanced disease. And then for people who are sort of stable and in the middle, um, we have uh, trials to, to, to observe the disease and learn more about it. Um, and uh, a lot of these trials uh, that are available to almost anybody are also focusing on gathering information about genetics um, and allowing us and our, and our scientists here at Northwestern to do research as well. Uh, examples of that are our biorepository and then also the, the PD gene uh, uh, from the Parkinson Foundation that was mentioned. So a lot of opportunities. Um, and, and then uh, we have uh, non-pharmacological non trials too. So we have trials going on things like employment um, uh, trials looking at exercise. So, uh, so not all of the trials uh, necessarily are for medications. So uh, ways to get involved. Number one, join our mailing list, uh, which uh, Aaron can uh, give you information about uh, uh, so you're aware of not only the educational events that we do, but also the, the, the research that we have. Um, our newsletter also, which actually just came out, also includes uh, research. Our website uh, has information on the trials that we're doing. Um, and then uh, other ways uh, are besides just what's going on at Northwestern, if you want to be aware of research that's just going on uh, anywhere in Parkinson's, definitely talk to us, to your, to your doctor. We can tell you about what trials might be right for you. Um, it's something that should be brought up at your visits. Um, uh, there's also uh, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, which is a little bit harder sometimes to navigate in terms of figuring out what's right for you. But uh, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can see uh, trials that are registered all over the country. Um, and then, it, you know, you can then usually talk, uh, bring those up at your appointments and, or, or ask us if those are right for you. Um, it often tells you also where those trials are going on. 
Um, and then uh, we have a, a big research team, uh, a research coordinators um, uh, who can field a lot of specific questions about trials, um, which, so again, just reaching out to us is the best way. Wonderful. And again, thank you to all our panelists today, all our presenters. We, again, greatly, greatly appreciate all of you. And so um, with that, we're going to conclude um, the Q&A. And again, we will absolutely send um, the response sheet out in an email. So again, thank you um, to all our presenters and panelists today. And thank you to Aaron for, for all your hard work today. So as the panelists sign off, um, I will close out the program in a moment. All right, so again, in closing, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here. At Northwestern, we pride ourselves on providing comprehensive care to everyone seen in our clinic. In addition to having a team of healthcare professionals, many of whom you heard speak today, our Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center offers several support groups and classes to further support your well being. Um, Dr. Bega mentioned them briefly in his intro. So these groups and classes include a Parkinson's, a general Parkinson's disease group, a women in Parkinson's group, a young onset PD group, a group for caregivers, a live virtual yoga class and PD 101. Um, and again, these are all virtual right now. Um, and as we look ahead to 2021, we really hope to continue adding innovative and supportive programs to our existing offerings. As a reminder, the recording of today's symposium, along with any resources we discussed, including my contact information, will be sent to attendees in a follow-up email within the next week or so. So that way you can reach out to me via email with any questions and of course sign up for our groups and classes. Um, I want to thank you to all our presenters and panelists, again, for sharing your time and expertise with us. And thank you to our sponsors, Abbott, Medtronic, Supernus, Synovian, Kiowa Kirin, Adamus, Boston Scientific, Lundbeck, and Amniel. And a huge, huge shout out to the Parkinson's Foundation for co-hosting this event. And with that, I want to thank you again for joining us, and we really hope to see you soon.